Welcome again to Grace Baptist Church, Jonesboro, Georgia, and to the Sunday school portion of our ministry, a Bible study. We continue today with the thought of authority, and today I want to begin looking at the authority of God's elect, the authority of God's elect. If I may, let me encourage you, earnestly encourage you to view or listen to last week's message concerning authority. Today's lesson and for several more weeks, the teaching will flow from that message from last week. To begin today's teaching, we must restate the meaning of the Greek word translated authority. When you look at Strong's Concordance, and I have the analytical Greek lexicon, which is overwhelmingly excellent in that it has every single word from the New Testament in alphabetical order according to the Greek alphabet. When we look at those two entities uh, on words, we see the word privilege, which is a key word in accordance with authority especially in reference to God's elect people. Authority in this case is a privilege, listen to this, authority is a privilege giving special advantage to God's elect people. Now I know that bothers some folks and then uh, I know there are some who may say, how do you reconcile that, that with the fact that God is not a respecter of persons? That's a good question. The scripture where it states that God is not a respecter of persons is found in Acts 10.34. But if you look at the context of what is being said there by Peter, it is stating that God does not show partiality to any national group. He saves Jews and Gentiles, non-Jews. These non-Jews come from every nation, tribe or kindred, tongue and people. Every kind of people, everywhere. Revelation 14, 6. All these segments of the entire human race will have a comparatively small number who are elect unto salvation. That group, that group of elect ones, will be birthed again from above spiritually by God. That new birth is a passive receiving of the Holy Spirit. It's given to you. That birthing, birthing those into the family of God and equipping them with faith to believe the gospel of Christ. Believing and receiving are the same thing. We receive the Holy Spirit from God according to his purpose in order that we might believe the gospel of Christ. Now I want to read today a literal expanded translation of John chapter 1 verses 12 and 13. Now when I say expanded, 
I do not mean a paraphrase or added words to the original Greek, but literal Greek words in their fullness. Sometimes one Greek word needs three, four, five English words to explain the fullness of that Greek word. Reading John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13 from a literal expanded translation. But as many as received him, speaking of receiving Christ, to them he delivered privilege to exist by creation as children of God to those believing into his name. Receiving and believing meaning the same thing. Who not of bloods, nor of will of flesh, nor of will of man, but of will of God were born. I hope maybe you will go back and listen to that again. As many as received Christ are those believing into his name. These were not born of bloods. In other words, this birth is not a reference, a reference to physical birth. Who you are related to. Your bloodline, your kindred. These were not born of flesh will. Not born according to our sinful nature. God forbid. These were not born of human will. Oh my goodness. That pretty much kills the idea of being born again to, due to the free will of mankind. But were born of God. And as I've explained, that enabled them to believe into Christ. But we must not overlook something else read in that context. I said to them he delivered privilege to exist by creation as children of God. Now I know most translations say power, authority. But as I told you, privilege in this case is a special advantage to the people of God. Because remember, your new birth was not something you brought about. It was brought about by God enabling you to believe into Christ. Special privilege. Specially privileged as new creations in Christ Jesus. To live as children of God endowed with spiritual rights, spiritual authority and power beyond the normal conditions of those who are unsaved. And though this is true of all Christians, there are measures of these special privileges in this present life on earth, and I want us to examine those today or begin examining them today. Gosh, for us today as Christians, I don't really know anything more important than we can be about than what we're going to discuss and discuss last week and we'll discuss for the next several weeks. Among God's elect, there is but one who has authority, power, privilege, and right measurelessly. Isaiah chapter 42, verses 1 through 9, 
Remember, we're talking about the elect of God. I want to talk about that most important elect of God. Isaiah 42, 1 through 9. Behold, says the Lord God, my servant, whom I uphold, my elect one, in whom my soul delights. That is so plain just on its face if you know the Bible. That's Jesus Christ and no one else. I have put my spirit upon him, says God the Father. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. If you're a non-Jew, folks, you better, thank, you better be giving thanks to God. He included all, every kind of person. Not every individual, but every kind of person in that realm of the elect. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. He will not cry out, nor raise, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and smoking flax he will not quench. He will bring forth justice for truth. He will not fail, he will not fail, nor be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth. The justice of God brought forth in the sacrifice of the perfect human being who was God being a substitute for the elect, him receiving their penalty and giving them, Christ giving them his righteousness. A perfect justice in the eyes of God. A perfect justice that satisfied God. The giving of Christ for his elect. He will not fail nor be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth. And the coastlands, the Gentile nations, shall wait for his law. Thus says God the Lord who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread them forth, who spread forth the earth and that which comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you, that's the Father speaking to the Son, in righteousness and will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the prison, those who sit in darkness from the prison house. I am the Lord. That is my name. And my glory I will not give to another, nor my praise to carved images. You see, there is no other God. That's what God is saying there. Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I declare before they spring forth, I tell you of them. The prophet speaks as the mouth of God, Isaiah, speaking. Among men, Christ alone has all authority, which he has always had and always will have. From everlasting to everlasting, he is God. From eternity to eternity, he is God. Constantly, always, he is God. And among God's elect, his authority is measureless. From here, we move on to those of human origin among God's elect. Talking about us. 
And here we see measure of authority given by God to accomplish his eternal purposes. And where do we begin? Well, it's, it's, it's not hard. We go to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, reading verses 19 through 22. Where do we begin among human beings, humanity, in looking at authority given by God? Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Speaking to the Gentiles, having been built on the foundation, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief corner. I know most of your Bibles say cornerstone, but the literal word is corner, which could have been a stone, but the one that holds everything together, the one in whom all things consist is Jesus Christ, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. The Spirit in us. We begin among humanity with the apostles and the prophets when it comes to authority. These scriptures clearly mention the apostles and the prophets at the top of the list among those with most authority in the church. I say those among, I say among those with most authority because at the pinnacle of that list, even here, now listen to me, is the apostle and high priest of our confession. Christ Jesus, whose testimony is the spirit of prophecy. You see, it was the spirit of Christ who was in the prophets testifying of our very salvation. Now, what I just said, you can find what I just said coming from Hebrews chapter 3, Revelation chapter 19, and 1 Peter chapter one, the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus, whose testimony is the spirit of prophecy and the spirit of Christ who was in the prophets testifying of this salvation. But back to mere men who God ordained, who God appointed to be apostles and prophets. Folks, this is, this is no joke. Uh, it is historical, but it's historical according to the eternal plan and purpose of the one true God. When we speak of apostles and prophets, be careful to realize that some of the New Testament apostles definitely exercise the office of the prophet. John's revelation, my goodness, the apostle John, the revelation, last book in the Bible. Paul's letters to the Thessalonians, speaking of the coming of Christ. Peter's Second letter, talking about the last days. All three of these apostles definitely display the prophetic role. The apostles also fulfilled that role. Prophets were not confined to the Old 
Testament. In Ephesians chapter 4, we saw the apostles mentioned first and then the prophets. I don't think you should read too much into that. If we do consider the Old Testament prophets, I don't think it would be a stretch to say that though they did not have the revelation of the apostles, the authority was much the same. Let me illustrate that by the evidence found in the Bible. In Luke chapter 4, verse 36, it is said of Christ, with authority and power, he commands unclean spirits and they come out. With authority and power. Concerning the apostles, we see this in Luke 9, 1. Then he, Jesus, called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all the demons and to heal diseases. In Matthew chapter 10, verses 1 through 4, these 12 are called both disciples and apostles, showing that the 12 original disciples were apostles. And one of those, we know, would betray him. Authority and power go hand in hand. Authority and power go hand in hand. In God's purpose for the universe, the heavens and the earth, there is no power without God-given authority to exercise that power. May I repeat that? There is no power without God-given authority to exercise that power. Power. Does anyone believe that Goliath did not have the power, the strength to kill David? Sure he did. But in the purpose of God, God withheld from Goliath the right, the authority to strike down David. Therefore, he was powerless to do so. If you read the biblical account, you'll see that's very true. This giant of a man standing before a young boy was powerless to take him out. It was David. It was David who was to be given authority as the king of Israel, that same David who received authority to represent God against the giant. And with the power of a stone, he struck down Goliath. And I must interject here a more fitting translation of part of Christ's encounter with Pilate in John 19 to illustrate the point I'm trying to make now. Really, I'm not trying to make it. I'm making it. I mean, it's clear. I pray that by God's Spirit, it will reach your mind and heart as it should. In John 19, once again, we have the Greek word I've been using as authority rather than power. Pilate said to Christ, Do you not know that I have the authority to crucify you? And the authority to release you? Jesus answered, You could have no authority at all against me unless it had been given you from above. Without the God-given authority, 
authority to exercise the strength of his soldiers due to his governmental office, Pilate had no right to crucify Jesus. But, as the apostle Peter said, Christ, being delivered by the predetermined counsel and foreknowledge of God, you, Pilate, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Acts 2, 23. Pilate was able to do what he did. He had the power to do what he did because God gave him the authority to do so. And with apostolic authority, Peter verified that fact on the day of Pentecost, as I just read, after the ascension of Christ back to the Father. Having established, and that's what I've done, having established that authority and power are so closely aligned, let's examine a few Old Testament prophets to demonstrate their authority was much the same as the New Testament apostles. Who better can we refer to than those two figures, those two prophets who appeared with Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration? Moses and Elijah. If you'd like to find that in the New Testament, Matthew chapter 16. First, let's look at Moses. Deuteronomy chapter 34. Deuteronomy chapter 34, verses 9 through 12. That, those are actually the last three verses in the book of Deuteronomy. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom. For Moses had laid his hands on him. My goodness. Does that not sound like the authority that the apostles had in the New Testament? So the children of Israel heeded him and did as the Lord had commanded Moses. But since then, there has not arisen in Israel a prophet like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. In all the signs and wonders which the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt. And we'll look at that in a moment. Before Pharaoh, before all his servants, and in all his land. And by all that mighty power and all the great terror which Moses performed in the sight of all Israel. Moses. The parting of the Red Sea. Moses. The bitter waters of Merah that became sweet. Moses. Water from the rock. Moses. But the, think of this now, but the authority of Moses to deliver the Ten Commandments to humanity makes his special privilege from God beyond dispute. Think of that, my friends. The Ten Commandments delivered by the hand of God to Moses who gave them to humanity. Elijah. Elijah the prophet. He lacked no credibility as to his God-given authority accompanied by supernatural power. Remember when Elijah raised the widow's son at Zarephath from the dead. And that power 
came from the authority he used in 1 Kings chapter 18. I want to go there. You need to listen to this. A great illustration. Elijah, illustrating his authority, which again was also verified by that power as we read this account. Now again, I'm taking select verses from 1 Kings chapter 18. So please listen, please listen, or you lose your place. So Ahab sent for all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together on Mount Carmel, the prophets of Baal. And Elijah came to all the people and said, How long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, if Baal, follow him. Elijah says, I alone am left a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets, 450 men. Therefore, let them give us two bulls. And let them choose one bull for themselves, cut in pieces, and lay it on the wood, but put no fire under it. And I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood, but put no fire under it. Then you call on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord, and the God who answers by fire, he is God. Now, folks, we know if you read that account, the prophets of Baal failed miserably. After repeated tries and cutting themselves until blood gushed out, which was their custom, but nothing happened. No fire came about. And then Elijah did this. After drenching, his sacrifice with water pots three separate time till everything was just absolutely deluged. Hear me, O Lord, prayed Elijah. Hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God and you have turned their hearts back to you again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust, and it licked up the water that was in the trench. Now when all the people saw, they fell on their faces. When all the people saw, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. And Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal, do, let, do not let one of them escape. So they seized him, them. And Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and executed them there. You know, the prophet of God prevailed because God performed for Elijah from heaven. And that brought to my mind that uh, verse from the Psalms, Psalm 57, 2, and, I, I'm, uh, and on into verse 3. I will cry out to God most high, to God who performs for me. He shall save me from heaven. And actually, I think it says, he shall sin from heaven and save me. And that is what happened in that account with Elijah. You know, it's undeniable as we listen to that, that the authority over the people by Elijah could not, could not be more clear than right there. He spoke and they obeyed. He commanded and they obeyed. They recognized his authority as God moved them to do so. 
His right to command was accompanied by his power to slay all 450 of the prophets of Baal. Now, as we move again to look at the New Testament apostles, and we're coming close to closing now, we continue to see the likenesses concerning their superiority. Now, again, when I say likenesses, I'm referring to the likenesses between the New Testament apostles and the Old Testament prophets concerning their superiority when it comes to authority accompanied by power. Now, I say that, folks, because since the death of the apostles and present-day saints are not endowed with the same level of authority and power as were the Old Testament prophets or New Testament apostles. Now, just listen to me. This is common sense, folks. What present-day saints or what saints, period, after the death of the apostles have penned any holy scripture? Who has had the authority to do that? Who has ever been given, since the death of the apostles, who has ever been given authority to present anything like the Ten Commandments to mankind? Again, since the last apostle died, there has been no saint on that level. Where is there any verifiable historical evidence of any saint who has had authority over all demons and with the power to cure all diseases. Now, I'm talking about the same kind of authority that the apostles had. And raise the dead back to life. Nobody's done that, folks. Which Christian since the apostles, has had an encounter with God like Moses at Mount Sinai or Paul on the road to Damascus or Peter when he received the vision from God about the acceptance of the Gentiles into the realm of his elect. Is there any elder today in the church? And I'm talking about elder in the sense of those with authority in the church. Who can deliver any saint to Satan for the destruction of the flesh as Paul did in the Corinthian church? I dare, I dare say no. We do not see that kind of authority today. Nor have we since the apostles ceased to be. If you see someone claiming, and we do see it today, right here where we live in this locale. If you do see someone claiming to be an apostle or a prophet, and folks, especially if they're women, Stay away from them like the plague. If anyone makes such a claim, they must have the same authority and power that God ordained apostles and prophets had. In other words, these people must be ordained by God to be apostles and prophets. That does not exist today. By their fruit, you will know them. You see, they can't lay their hands on someone and they don't actually get healed. 
They can't make some prophetic uh, move and then it doesn't come to pass. The apostles and the prophets were true apostles and prophets and were known by their fruit. Next week, next week, because I know you must have some questions. Next week, more on authority of present day saints. And if you are a Christian, that means you. Be here, be here next week. And let's both, you and I, hear from the Lord God. Amen.